Welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who is very happy to hear that in some cases, smaller is better. Mr. Lauren Bobgarden, Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on, man? How are you, my friend? I'm doing great, man. Doing very, very good. Happy to be back. Happy to be chatting with you and uh, all of our Likewise. mighty, mighty listeners in the Outlaw audience. It is a pretty awesome posse. I agree with that. I, I, I agree with that fully. So let's go ahead and uh, and kick things off. This week, we're going to go into the garage, talk about some trailers and some news. And the first thing we're going to talk about in the way of trailers is the Assassin's Creed Syndicate story trailer, which just came out. Why am I suffering through another Assassin's Creed trailer, Lauren? Tell me. Uh, so here, <laughs> by the way, here's, nice life preserver. McFly. Here's the. Uh, here's the. Uh, <laughs> Brent's referring to the fact that it is now cold where I live, and I have a vest on right now. But, um, but you do look a lot like Marty in in Back to the Future. Ah, uh, that's what I was going. Except for. his was um, maroon, I think. Uh, so here's the thing, Brent Adams. Something weird is going on in my household, and I'm frankly Whoa, it frightens dude, me. Dude, dude, come! I mean, there's stuff I don't need to know about. You know, the, you need to know this. You do need to know this. Oh. Uh, and, and frankly, it frightens me. And here's what's happening, Feel Brent. Dirty. I'm not really excited for many games left for the rest of 2015. To be candid with you, okay. which um, well, well, and well, what what else is there? I mean, there's there's a few things, but there's several things. There's there's Fallout Four. Yeah, there's okay. Battlefront. There's just cause three. Yeah. Uh, this week, the new, the new Transformers yeah, game comes out. Ah, fuck it! Now I'm excited too. Uh, uh, but I'm not. I don't know. I'm oh, having you this like excited. Right. Right. Sorry. I'm not sorry. excited. Right. And so so oddly, well, what's wrong with you? Well, here's the. You're gonna. This is. This gets worse, Brent. It's not just that, but the one game that I'm sort of now looking forward to. Yeah. Is somehow the moment we're recording this, and, and I reserve the right to take this back. It kind of like I'm not drunk right now, but as if I were, <laughs> is Assassin's Creed Syndicate. All right, that's that's I, very I don't, that's very odd. I mean, I'm not going to break I, your I balls over it too much. I don't know what's going on, man. So this trailer, well, the story just, trailer well, came let me out. Just ask you before you before you move on. Let me just ask you. In the immortal words, I'm embarrassed right now. In the immortal words of the crew from Top Gear. Is this because of a bet? <laughs> it is not because are of a wearing bet. The, are you wearing the vest for a bet? And <laughs> is the Assassin's Creed somehow tied to it? Somehow tied to this bet? So I, I don't know what it is, man. I've been watching. So at the same, roughly the same time this trailer came out, uh, a little, maybe a little bit before, but about a week, a little over a week ago, mm -hmm. uh, Ubisoft. Uh, flew a bunch of people out to play their game, and a bunch of people released gameplay videos, and I've been watching tons of them, and they all thankfully say very clearly up front ubisoft is sponsoring this video they paid to fly us out that sort of thing yeah but as i'm watching the gameplay and there's some information out there particularly from videogamer.com where they said they're very concerned about the technical state of the game right as they played it and that they were struggling to hit 30 fps just like syndicate was but the, the, you know they they were ho hoping that you know it being a month out that that wouldn't be a problem mm -hmm. but they did say despite the technical issues they felt like the game had was really a step forward uh, from what Unity uh, had experienced, and there's just I, I don't know if, I don't know if it's the setting, Brent. I, I don't know if it's the the two lead actors. Um, I, I the voice acting that I've seen, I've really really enjoyed. Uh, they've now included um, a new mechanic where you have essentially what is you know the grappling hook from Batman mm -hmm. uh, in the game, uh, which changes things. They're, they're, the fighting looks uh, brutal, more brutal and interesting and. I, there's something about it. I'm so, I am definitely not buying this game ahead of time until I see some reviews and see if it's actually functional. Yeah. Um, and there's a big, big t brouhaha right now about the fact that they just announced that there will be microtransactions in the game. Uh, although Ubisoft is, uh, as as you might expect, ex um, uh, staunchly uh, saying that the microtransactions there's nothing in them that you can't earn by playing. It's just for people that don't want to. That would rather pay money than than you know op wait to open stuff up in the game, um, and if that's truly the case, then I don't have a necessarily a problem with it. But you know that stuff tends to affect design. But um, I know you have a big problem with it if, it if if fucking Assassin's Creed Syndicate was on the iPad or the fucking Android tablet. I know you'd have a big problem with it then. 
Well, it's it's uh, I, there's a great video we might even talk about next week that Jim Sterling did talking about this very thing. But I don't know. There's something about this game, and I can't put my finger on it uh, that that is attracting me in the way the last uh, Assassin's Creed did not. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know, man. But I, I don't. I don't know what's going on, and I'm scared by it. I'm scared. Isn't this always the story, though? Isn't isn't the story always that we look at Assassin's Creed trailers and we say, man. That looks pretty fucking fun, and then we get the game and we play the game, and inevitably we don't feel like it's a, it's as much fun. Now, Black, uh, 110%. Black Flag might be might be an exception in that case because I know you did have a lot of fun with Black Flag. I did have a lot of fun with Black Flag, and you're a hundred percent right. And I talk about this on the show. I talk about how how like this keeps happening, and I'm aware of it. And and I but with Unity because of it, with Unity I had absolutely no interest. And when they announced this game. I had absolutely no interest, but now that I'm watching the videos, I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting sucked in again. Yeah. But we'll, we'll wait and see what the reviews are. I think on this one, just to get some idea. But right now, I'm, I'm, I don't know, man. I'm interested. So I guess that there's a couple of things that I would say here. Number one, I think that you've fallen victim to ubification. I think <laughs> that much is clear at this point. Yes. Uh, the, uh, the other thing is, I I don't know. Like I haven't really seen anything that changed my mind. The, the two things that stuck out to me in this trailer were, number one, the fact that they seem to be alluding to, uh, and, and I've not been reading about the game, so it's possible that they've been shouting this from the rooftops, and I, I've just not been paying attention to them, but they make reference to taking over various gangs, and, yes. and, and I, was, I was wondering about, ooh, is this going to be some sort, of, some sort of adaptation or answer to the nemesis mechanic? from uh, Shadow of Mordor that we like so much? Mm. Uh, will, will there be some equivalent kind of gameplay going on? And then the second thing I was going to say is, I think that this is the most movie trailer-like game trailer I have seen in a long time. I, I was watching this, and I could not get over how it is paced identically to what a genre film might do with its own trailer just in in terms of the the way that they are simultaneously doing some exposition they're setting up the major players and then just like you know there's like all these action beats and then they've got it offset with you know comedic quips and one-liners and everything i i was i was really and and perhaps perhaps that you know there's been something that we watched last week that it just didn't strike me as much but i was watching this and I'm like wow it, it's almost like they took uh, a, a trailer for for a major action film and just dissected it and just you know put in like their own footage and their own dialogue uh but but left you know all the edits and all the pacing exactly the same like it it was it was remarkable how how much it felt like a film trailer as opposed to a game trailer certainly there certainly this trailer is the story trailer it is absolutely cut like that but i encourage you guys if you're interested to go check out the gameplay and i'm curious to hear what other uh outlaws have to say about this I, again I, I don't know what's happening I, I may come back next week and think what the hell was i talking about last week but for whatever reason that's what's happening to me right now i'll tell you something else that is happening right now and that is that whole augment your pre-order or isn't. bullshit <laughs> just got shut the fuck down yep. is uh, what happened so squeenix has put up a post on the official deus ex website which you might be surprised to learn is deus ex.com but anyway over in their news section, uh, they've got a release called Shutting Down Augment Your Pre-Order, which uh, is dated uh, the 1st of October, and they go on to explain that uh, they at uh, both Square Enix and IDOS Montreal have been listening to everything everybody's had to say about the Augment Your Pre-Order program, and quote, when it was first conceived, we wanted the program to give you more choice about what you received in terms of pre-order incentives, because we've seen in the past that when we choose to package ourselves when we choose those packages ourselves and split them across regions, it caused frustration. We quickly noted that this approach created even more frustration than before, resulting in a resounding amount of negative feedback, end quote. It's interesting to me that they say here that the impetus for creating this program was to lessen confusion and frustration over complexity in pre-orders. It's it's very ironic to me that this was seen as the solution to that problem. Uh, they have now said that they are going to make all of the pre-order content available to everyone who pre-ordered the game or who purchased a day one addition to the game. And in addition to that, the game is no longer going to come out early for some people, but will release to everyone on the actual release date, uh, which uh, is February the 23rd, 2016, 
And they thank everyone for being so passionate about the game and giving their feedback. Blah, 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 blah. So, victory! Victory! Uh, very happy to hear this because the Augment Your Pre-Order thing was one of the the most egregious publisher pre-order things I've seen in recent memory. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad it got shut down. I'm glad it got shut down by people screaming from the rooftops. I- I'm, I'm very happy about this. So... Yeah, so in, in another, what I would consider to fall into that sort of fuck you vein, mm-hmm. uh, in my opinion, Brent, is our next story, actually. I don't have anything to add to that one, because you pretty much summed it up. Uh, it's, it's, it's what you said is, uh, as always, um, well, it's what you said. So um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, we can both agree um, on that, at least. Next up, uh, Brent in the Garage, is another one that, I, that kind of might fall into that category, and that is the announcement of a new website called Open Critic. Ah, uh, yes, the, I heard about this. Open Critic is an alternative, essentially. It was designed specifically to be an alternative to Metacritic. Well, a game-specific alternative to Metacritic. A game, yes, which is which in my mind makes it even better. Yeah. <laughs> um, this comes from, uh, it was started by a Riot Games product manager, Matthew uh, uh, Enthoven. Um, and it, the idea is basically to pr- provide an alternative to Metacritic where everything is completely transparent mm-hmm. about how the scores are used, and they are used... Uh, without weight, they are average. Yeah. Uh, it's just, just it's just an average, right? And so Take the six idea, review scores add mul- add divide them together, by divide by six, correct? And so Fine. the idea was that you know here, we have this thing in our industry called Metacritic that people actually have performance based bonuses on, and mm-hmm. different people have different weights uh, in terms of how they affect the overall Metacritic score, and all of it is secret and behind the scenes, and nobody knows what they are. And so uh, some people in the industry said, you know what, this is bullshit. We're going to go start a new website. It's called Open Critic, and I love it, man. I absolutely love it. I think uh, it's on my toolbar now, and I don't see any reason why I would go back to Metacritic as opposed to here, where there's a complete aggregate. Uh, it, it basically is essentially the same thing as Metacritic, only there's no um, erroneous waiting to it behind the scenes. And so still, I still my preference is the style in which Eurogamer uh, puts up their reviews, but if you go to Open Critic, you'll see they they sort of they take the websites based on how they do their site. So they're not taking, for example, Eurogamer and turning into a number and factoring it in, but they do include the Eurogamer review in their slew of reviews. And where it would say, for example, 9.0 out of 10 for a website that actually gave it a numeric rating, Mm -hmm. it says for Eurogamer, it says recommended. It actually uses the terminology that Eurogamer Eurogamer uses. uses. That's exactly right. Rock, paper, shotgun is there. Mm -hmm. They get a, they get their little, you know, paragraph blurb and the link to the full thing there's just not a rating there and they're not factored in but they're all still aggregated right there it's it's fantastic i absolutely love it yeah I, th- I think that's the thing that i'm probably most excited about and you know this is something that we've talked about a number of times since eurogamer and other sites have have said that they're going to stop using numeric scores for games and and instead uh have have this more uh this this more subjective kind of recommendation system and i I, I, I love that. I mean, like I, we talked about a number of times what we wanted to see out of Metacritic, and it seems like Open Critic might actually give us that that ability to go to a review page for a game and to see, to just read th- those real quick summations from a Rock Paper Shotgun or a Eurogamer, and to just see, like in in very quick order, a few sentences from several outlets that tell you what they think of the game, and 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 really, I think. That for, for me and for a lot of people, that will be enough to kind of tell us whether or not the game is what it what it's supposed to be, whether it's broken, that kind of stuff. Uh, with without you know getting into this this whole hashing over, is it a nine point five or is it a nine point seven five or is it a, you know is it a, a ten or is it a three? And you know just because that that stuff is worthless in my opinion. So I'm very yeah, it's- very happy about this as well. I I think I think it's great. I love to see I love to see frustration lead to innovation you know rather than it rather than than you know just kind of feeling like there there's oh there's no alternative we're trapped by the tyranny of metacritic it's like well why are we trapped by the tyranny of metacritic you know why don't we just want somebody just go out there and do it better I, I really have enormous respect for you know for people that see the world and and take that approach to it absolutely it's wonderful go check it out guys opencritic.com and along those lines Brent, yes. we have our last item in the garage very very similar Yes, uh, which we are very, very pleased to announce to everybody, and that is the one and only, the man himself, the D-Money Shizzle. The man, the uh, myth, the hair. Uh, many of you always ask us, uh, or many of you will ask us from time to time what Dan Danny's up to, how he's doing, 
Um, why isn't he on this show? Why isn't he really just, why isn't he this show? <laughs> why uh, didn't he do this show instead of us? I'm just, I'm just kidding. Uh, our, our, our own Daniel Kaiser has started off on a new endeavor, and we want to share it with you guys. Danny, Daniel's going to come on here uh, on the show, hopefully sometime in the coming weeks, and talk to you about it. But he's launched a new website officially called GoKidGamer.com. That's Go, G-O, Kid, K-I-D, Gamer.com, all one word. Um, and it is, uh, it is his new endeavor, and it's about teaching parents about how to interact and talk and know what's going on with their kids relative to video games. And I think it is a fucking fantastic idea. Yeah. This is something that Daniel's very passionate about. And, uh, and, and over the years he talked many times about certain things within, within the game industry and also within the game media industry that frustrated him. Uh, he, he talked many times about feeling like there was not sort of a kid friendly, game outlet that uh that you know that he would feel comfortable you know telling his kids to go and and check up on news stories and things like that that they would you know see things that were appropriate to them and not otherwise and and also you know his frustration about about the level of of consumer awareness consumer education surrounding games you know you hear these these stories about parents going into gamestop with you know their eight-year-olds and the eight-year-old picks up grand theft auto and you know the person behind the counter is like, "Are you aware of you know what's in Grand Theft Auto? Are you sure that you sure you want this?" The parents are like, "Oh yeah, whatever he wants, it's fine." You know, so and, and you know Daniel wanted to be very similar like what we were just saying. He wanted to be proactive uh, in, in that regard uh, w- with this new venture. I don't want to speak for him too much because obviously he's going to go into all this. But it's just what I'm saying is while uh, I did not have you know anything to do with this or any pre knowledge of it, I just know that this is something Daniel is specifically very very passionate about and when when he told me what he was doing and uh and and i checked out go kid gamer uh, it was one of those like oh yeah like match made in heaven it's like i can't believe that you you know didn't start doing this years ago this is such a good idea and a good fit for you so we want to uh, we want to wish daniel the best with this we will have him on and talk to him more about it and for anybody out there who is a uh, a gaming parent who has kids uh who game this is definitely something that you're going to want to check out. I think that uh, I think DK is going to do a great job with this and provide some really really valuable uh, information to uh, to families who game. Absolutely. So please go check out his website, check out his Facebook profile, like him on Facebook, sign up for the newsletter. As you know, a new endeavor always use additional help. And uh, Daniel is very fortunate to have this amazing army behind him. So go out and proselytize on his behalf. Don't be fooled by the long hair. However, you also want to go and pick out his signature line of hair conditioner and other fine <laughs> hair care products. Well, I mean, while we're sitting here plugging, we might as well go ahead and, and get that out of the way too. <laughs> And we're back in the clubhouse, Brent. Before we get to the topic this week, why don't you set up the poll and knock it down for us? Always, always. So last week, we were talking about the decline in mobile gaming and what that might mean for the game industry. And we asked you all the question, what do you think the decline in mobile gaming means for the game industry? Last place, 2% of the vote. You said it will hurt the industry if we lose the money or attention brought by mobile games. Not... A lot of takers on that one. In third place, 15%, you said mobile devs will shift to AA or indie-style titles on traditional platforms. The second place answer with 39% was renewed focus on real games. Companies will follow the money back to core gamers. But the number one answer with 44% was, I don't think it will make much of a difference. Which is interesting. Uh, uh, I, I, I definitely would not have pegged the nothing like it's not going to change anything uh as as being the answer but i suppose that you know we'll just have to kind of wait and see you know whether this decline continues or not you know perhaps if we see more declines over the course of say the next year uh then th- then perhaps the, the situation will be different but um i figure if they're losing money something's going to change I, I i i doubt that they'll i doubt that they will sit still for too long if they feel like if they feel like they're uh, they're losing losing customers, uh, I would have to agree with that, Brent. Obviously, I you know I don't give a shit about mobile gaming. So, I heard. Um, <laughs> so speaking of not sitting still and losing money, Brent. Yeah. The topic this week. So there's an article that came out on Game Informer 
that was very cloak and dagger mm. when you read it. They wouldn't they wouldn't name their sources. <clears throat> but they talk about the article is titled uh, prominent voice actor says publishers unwilling to negotiate proposed fee or condition changes. And what what the unnamed uh, voice actor, the unnamed prominent voice actor is alluding to uh, are conversations between voice actors for interactive media members of SAG-AFTRA uh, who were attempting to negotiate with interactive entertainment publishers uh, about uh, both their working conditions and the way in which they're compensated. Right. Uh, and it seems it uh, seems like, according to this article, uh, that they walked to the table in good faith to uh, have negotiations with the publishers in the interactive entertainment industry. Uh, and what they got back was essentially, yeah, we're not interested in, in hearing what you have to say at all. Uh, and you guys can listen to what we have to say. And that's about it. And so apparently, Brent, there's conversation about striking at this point. Yes, that's what they say. And um, the... It seems that there are a number. There's a number of factors that the the voice actors union is is wanting to bring up here. The one that keeps getting mentioned, although th- this unnamed source is very specific in pointing out that this is not a single issue uh, negotiation. But the one referring th- specifically to the, the uh, one residual compensation is residuals. That's right. Which, which, for those who don't know, residuals are just a. Uh, it, it's where like like the somebody in this case a voice actor would get a percentage of the the profits from you know whatever the endeavor is. It's usually like very small, uh, but you know they'll, they'll get some some sort of residual payment in the form of a percentage on whatever profits you know, the video game that they appear in, uh, make, I, I can never talk about royalties or residuals without, uh, thinking about, uh, UHF, the, uh, the Weird Al Yankovic cult movie. I, I remember seeing an interview one time with, uh, fucking, uh, Emo Phillips in which he talked about how he still earns residuals on UHF and he held up like his latest residuals check and it was 17 cents or something like that. You know? Right, yes, <laughs> he still, yes. But he still gets a percentage of it. Anyway. Now, a classic example, Brian, is TV series when they go into syndication. So actors will get residuals and that's all well and good. And then suddenly seven, eight years after the series has been running, maybe 10 years even or something like that, it gets syndicated. So it's not just meaning it gets shown all over the country at four or five o'clock in the afternoon kind of thing. And the actors will get money for that. Those are residuals. Yeah. So right. That's a classic example. And I assume in the context of gaming, it would be something like a percentage of the sales, which for, for, uh, you know, remember when these games, they, they have, the games have a, uh, a very steep decline after the first three weeks in sales, uh, but it's a pretty long tail. And frequently uh, games a year out, two years out, will go on sale for significantly less than what they retailed for initially. But they can garner hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars in sales sometimes when they're cut to $15 or something like that. And, I, and I, my guess is is that they're not being compensated under those circumstances. Well, they're not being compensated. And I'll tell you who else is not being compensated. <laughs> That's game developers. And there's a, uh, th- there's a link in this article uh, that, uh, that points to it, – it's actually another piece over at Game Informer, uh, but it, uh, it, it statements – that Alex Hutchinson, who was the uh, the director on Far Cry 4, that he made on Twitter, in, in which he says, uh, you know, if Will Wheaton gets gets residuals on games before the people who actually made the game get residuals on games, then the system is broken. And, and you know, Will Wheaton responded, and I, it, it was kept civil and everything, but it definitely indicates that there is going to be a little bit of friction on this point because ultimately voice actors spend maybe a few weeks working on a game and they're talking about earning a percentage of the of the 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 profits on that game where the people who spent years working on the game are not getting that uh not being afforded that same consideration and so certainly there's going to be some um there there's going to be some some rough waters ahead if uh, if this gets approved it's it's definitely going to going to shake things up and I I don't know that I don't know that game developers are in a position to to do this. Although there's really no reason that they they shouldn't be able to, because obviously the games don't get made without them. But whether or not they are uh, they are unified enough in this or, or organized enough to to pull off something similar remains to be seen. 
It is an interesting... So there's a couple of things that are interesting here also, Brent. One of them is that SAG-AFTRA is involved. So SAG is the Screen Actors Guild. AFTRA, and I'm going to probably say this wrong. I didn't look it up, but it's it's film, television, and radio actors, I believe. Yeah. Uh, it could be the Association of or American. I'm not sure. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's essentially... Uh, SAG is a Screen Actors Guild, and, and AFTRA is um, uh, film, television, radio, and then there's Actors' Equity, which is not part of this, but uh, which is theater. But um, So first of all, these are two huge unions, uh, and it's, it's uh, interesting that they are involved. It, it speaks to sort of the business of game making, right? And um, yeah. the, the uh, size and, and uh, swath uh, that game making is, is cutting. Um, and then additionally, there is, you know, it, I would, I would be curious what the sort of comparison is to film. So do crew members, uh, typically get, uh, residuals on something? Do directors typically get residuals? Do producers get typically get residuals? And what would be comparable there? So Alex Hutchinson's, you know, uh, conversation about that, which absolutely on the face of it makes perfect sense. Um, sure. I, I do know I worked in film for a while and I do know that certainly nobody, what we used to call below the line. Uh, uh, ever makes residuals, right? Basically, Which is sort if of your name is not on the poster, you're below the line. <laughs> right, essentially, yeah, essentially, uh, and, and even many of the people above the line uh, certainly don't get residuals. And if there are the people that no, get residuals, I mean, like, you know, like the cinematographer is not going, you know, like they're no. not going to get residuals. No, but that cinematographer on set is a very sort of high ranking member of that team, right? Mm-hmm. Very, very high ranking. They don't get residuals. I don't know that directors sort of routinely get residuals. It, it, it just depends on the deal they're able to negotiate. I mean, right. you know, sometimes they are, sometimes they're not. Um, you know, if, if, if you're, if, if you're a big enough name, then, and you're, you're in demand, like Steven Spielberg, like, Steven Spielberg's <laughs> making residuals on his I was going to say like, like Spielberg. Bet, bet your ass. Uh, he's making residuals. Well, do you th- but is his Mexican equivalent Spielberg making it is what I want to know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so it, it is an interesting conversation. I understand what Al- Alex Hutchison is saying. Sure. Um, at some point, do we begin to have the conversation like in film and television and movies? Like, are people buying games because Alex Hutchinson is making them? Or are people buying games because Kiefer Sutherland or Kevin Spacey are in them? Uh, I'm not saying yes if, to either if, one, if necessarily. If, uh, I'm sorry, you said Kevin Spacey. I was going to say, if Kevin Bacon is voice acting a fucking game, I'm buying the game for Kevin Bacon. <laughs> That's your ass at that. Uh, I did buy, what was it called? Ro- was it Rogue Warrior or whatever that Mickey Rourke? Uh, oh. Like the worst game ever oh, made. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah, I that? think I paid four ninety nine just to hear Mickey Rourke doing that. Uh, there there doing wasn't that any game. other fucking reason to do it. That's exactly right. So it, it, it is an interesting conversation, Brent. It does, uh, uh, as you had alluded to earlier, you know, bring up some of the the business side of of the, ge- the industry of the that we business. don't. Necessarily, yeah, that's exactly right. That we don't frequently see. Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know. Like you know, I tend to be more excited about. And therefore, more focused on the end product that the video game industry puts out. I think that uh, it, it does. It does kind of show that the game industry has moved from sort of a motley collection of of developers and and, and game enthusiasts who just you know really got excited about games and started building them into this massive, massive entertainment industry that uh, that has turned into. And you know, this is just this is just you know stuff that's going to happen along the way. The thing. Specific to uh, the the voice acting and the residuals and all that, I think that the reason that actors are able to secure those kinds of things for themselves, where somebody like a cinematographer might not be able to, is because of the fact that, by and large, film and television, uh, the the product being sold is is your actors, your your headliners. You know, you're paying for a name and a face that the ticket buying audience wants to go see in a film and having that name or that face attached to your product is valuable to you. It it, it may be the make or break that, you know, that gets your film made at all, or that, you know, turns your film into, you know, some stupendous fucking uh, smash hit, whatever the case may be. And I don't know if, I I guess I, I I'm not even going to say that. I don't think at least right now, I don't think that the acting talent plays that same role in games. I'm not saying that Nolan North is not a big reason why Uncharted isn't great, but I don't play every game Nolan North does a voice in. 
Right. I, you know, it's interesting, Brent, because I agree no with you. Because in it. You know what I mean? Correct. And I, I agree with you and disagree with you, that statement you just made, which was that you don't, and which, and I think you're going to agree with what I will say, but your statement was something along the lines of, uh, you don't think that acting plays that significant of a role in the game. No, and no, I would no, no. say that. What I'm saying is it doesn't play that significant of a role in my purchasing decision. Purchasing decision. I, I agree with that. So I could give a shit if Kevin Spacey or Kiefer Sutherland is in a game at all. As a matter of fact, oftentimes I find it distracting. Um, I did find it distracting to have Martin Sheen in Mass Effect uh, because he was the only person of that caliber in the game, and his voice is so recognizable to me that I felt like it disconnected me from that character. Um, so I, I, I couldn't care less. I mean, it's it's great. I love that these people are doing it. There are some they, they are insanely talented people, and I love they're doing it that they're doing work in video games. But I don't care that they're necessarily doing it in video games, except as what it you know speaks to the, the state of the industry. Um, but I do care tremendously about quality acting in a game. Uh, and Nolan North is a classic example of that. And I went back and played the Uncharted demo, which I don't have, I didn't put in the road this week. But uh, immediately it stood out to me, like, how good the voice acting was in that yeah. game. And when I'm watching Assassin's Creed Syndicate, I'm, I'm noticing a difference in the quality of the of voice acting in the game. And I think the acting, vo- the acting in a game can 100% take a game that's sort of good and make it great. Or take a game that's good and make it bad and cheesy and awful. Sure. Um, well, I, I, so I mean, if you've been playing games long enough, you could remember the early days of voice acting in games and just how bad it was. So I think, I mean, I think high quality actors are very important to video games. What I don't care about yeah. is what their name is. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, honestly, but, not to be disrespectful, but I don't. You're right. I don't buy a game because Nolan North is no, in it. I, I, agree, it. I agree with you because I mean, like Nolan North or Troy Baker or the, the, these are fant- these are like fantastically talented people. Amazing. I mean, like the yes. last thing that I saw Nolan North playing in, he was like the dad who had four lines on, you know, like uh, Pretty Little Liars or you know, you know, so, some show my my wife watches about. You know, high school girls and intrigue and oh, you mean on like on TV? Yeah, or I, I mean, like like right. he was like a walk on role in a fucking television show. He had like four lines, and then like went back and oh yeah, I saw him in Modern Family recently. Like went back into the kitchen to make a sandwich or whatever he did. But you know that that's, yeah, that's yeah. the thing is that here's this tremendously talented guy who has almost no recognition whatsoever outside of the game industry. You know. Right, but even but like you said, even though he's got tremendous recognition in the game industry, I'm not going to buy, uh, you know, Forza Six because Nolan North voices the lead character. Yeah. Well, what was that fucking um, Rocket Pack game? Uh, Dark Void, Dark Void that uh, that Nolan North did. You know, just because Nolan North plays the lead in your fucking game <laughs> means nothing as to whether or not that game is going to be a gigantic steaming pile of donkey right, feces. That's, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. No, it, it's a different relationship for th- for sure, and it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see how this all plays out. Certainly, I respect the work that they do. Uh, I think everybody, uh, it, it, you know, from the gamer st- point standpoint, does, but. Uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing, Brent. I mean, it, go, it, it all goes back to that sort of concept of, of uh, you know, the whole conversation of who who gets paid when created with creative endeavors, and and you know, when you're talking about millions of dollars being made and that sort of thing, it's a it's an interesting thing for sure. When you're talking about millions of dollars being made. The one thing you can bet on is that nobody wants to give up their millions of dollars. They part with that very, very reluctantly. But uh, that is a true story. The, you know, the thing of it is, I mean, it's not that. I mean, like, Jack Nicholson is the Joker. Like, the only reason, like, Jack Nicholson is in that fucking 89 Tim Burton Batman movie is because the guy got bank. I mean, he got paid, like, a major salary up front. His name is above Keaton's on a fucking movie. And in addition to that, he gets percentages of the movie, the merchandise, and anybody that ever does anything with the fucking Jack Napier character or that version of the Joker in perpetuity, Jack Nicholson makes money off of. So... You know, that deal got Jack Nicholson to play the Joker, which was a great fucking thing right up until Heath Ledger played the Joker. But, um, you know, so, you know, these things, it's not just like good, bad, whatever. I mean, hey, if you can get fucking Jack Nicholson into your video game by giving him a lot of money and a percentage of the back end, you should probably do that. Kevin Spacey, we don't give a fuck about. Jack Nicholson, different story. I would like to see a Shining video game. Oh, don't even tease me. I- I'm masturbating right now. Oh, my, <laughs> oh God. my God. What a fucking awesome idea. <laughs> that was not the reaction I was going for. <laughs> Get your hand in my pants and tell me more about this Shining video oh. game. Oh, dear God. Good <laughs> sweet Jesus. All right, everybody. 
everybody. We're going to hit the road. And uh, before we do that, I'm going to kick things over to Lauren Baumgarten, who's still trying to get the taste of that last segment out of his mouth. Lauren, oh my. Oh, what have you been oh, playing? Man, this week? You, oh, Jesus, God, it's getting worse. Uh, all right, Brent. So I played a few games this week. Um, first of all, I fired up Insurgency. I got together for the first time in. Uh, almost two years, Brent. I played a little, just once or twice while we were in Brazil, but for the first time in a long, long time, I got my boys back together, uh, the fellas that I usually play online with. We haven't played much in the last couple of years, like, and we fired up. like Aaron and the gang? Aaron, yep, Aaron and Danny and Jasper, uh, and uh, we fired up Insurgency, which is a source, uh, uh, first-person shooter multiplayer uh, built on the Source engine. Yep. Um, and it is a tremendous amount of fun. If you guys haven't played Insurgency, I highly recommend you check it out. It's sort of uh, halfway between CSGO and Battlefield, kind of. Uh, as I said, done in the Source engine. There's a bunch of different modes, uh, different you know progressive modes with, with checkpoints or you know capturing and holding checkpoints. And uh, it's kind of like a hardcore version uh, of those games, though, because there's very like a couple bullets and you're dead. There's no like medics and shit like that. There's different classes that, in terms of what weapons you get, uh, and then you're given, depending on the mode you're in, you're given X amount of, um, you, you know, dinero to spend. I don't remember. I don't know if they call it points or money or whatever, right. but like you start off with six points and you can use it to buy a heavy barrel or a foregrip or a suppressor or these kind of rounds or have extra grenades or whatever. And you can outfit your dude however you want. Um, some of the modes uh, you get, like you start out and you have to play with a, you know, it's not like a, a battlefield where you're ranking up and opening, unlocking kits that you can then use forever. Each mode, or depending on how the server is set, uh, you may start off with just iron sights and an M416, uh, and then you got to during the course of that game work your way up. But it has nothing to do with the next time you play in a different server. Uh, so it's a very cool game. Uh, I, I just had the, the just a tremendous amount of fun playing with the boys. So uh, that was a good good time, Brent. I fired up Rocket League no, again. Did you? Uh, for all of about five minutes. Uh, again, I jumped into ranked play right off the bat, and uh, two matches in a row that I played with two teammates that like couldn't hit a ball if we attached a giant paddle to the top of their fucking car, and it was so we were we were losing like seven eight to nothing kind of thing. Uh, it it was so annoying because they were so bad, and there's nothing I could do about it, and it dropped my ranking in two games down by twenty five points, Jesus. and it was. It's, <laughs> It was awful. I was I went from like I, I was already at like sixty or something or fifty five from the last time that happened yeah. to play two matches. Now I'm down in the thirties somewhere, which is just brutally awful and completely unrepresentative. And so I, I don't want to play ranked ever again unless I'm playing with people I actually know. Uh, and I'm concerned if I go back and play unranked, it's going to be a bunch of idiots. But we'll see. I'll try playing unranked. So that's my brief uh, Rocket League update, Brent. But I really, what I really want to talk about is the Need for Speed beta. Oh, I was so hoping what you were about to say is my even briefer accounting of the Need for Speed beta. Damn it. Uh, because I'm long-winded or because you don't give a shit about Need for I Speed? Because I don't give a shit about Need for Speed. You're going to give a shit about this. All right, so, I'm listening. So first of all, I, I do want to say I downloaded and tried to play the Rainbow Six Siege beta on PS4, mm, yeah. and I could not get it to work. It would not connect to the servers. It was unplayable for 24 hours, so I just gave up. Um, Need for Speed, however, uh, I was able to play. And from a driving stand... So first of all, the game is just like ludicrously gorgeous, Brent. Okay. I mean, ludicrously gorgeous, to the point of... So this is what's interesting about this game, and this is why you're going to want to hear about it. They're doing something that I don't remember, and, and you might say... Um, uh, I want to say Red Commander. Rogue, I can't remember what it's called. Um, I've never seen in a game myself, and that is all their cutscenes are live action. You mean with like a- all of them w- with with actual actors on camera? Yes, live action actors. Yeah, what was that? The, the last one that did that? I want to say Red Commander or Command and Conquer. Command and Conquer. Command and Conquer. Command and Conquer. Yeah, Flair right, versus right, right, Bear. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this is really interesting. I love the campaign so for that game. I have to say it annoyed me. It annoys me less than I thought it would. They're trying. Uh, what annoys me is that they're trying to like these caricatures of like young hip, you know, semi hip hop, semi like cool uh, people are just. Are, are just these awful caricatures, yeah. but uh, but the fact that but even then it's not annoying me as much as I thought it would. And the kid who plays like the lead guy, not not the character that you are, but the sort of lead live action actor, uh, is actually pretty good. Uh, and so, unfortunately, the people around him really aren't that good. And the whole thing is shot as if you're looking through your eyes. So like you'll see your hand come out in front of the camera to grab a drink, kind of thing, and mm-hmm. he'll hold the drink up to the camera, you know, all that stuff. Um, but. What's kind of cool is they sh- they'll be showing live action footage, 
like you say you're in the garage and you'll be talking to the chick that runs the garage and it camera pans over to your car and then all of a sudden you're in the virtual environment and you can interact with the car it's that realistic looking right. like the transition between the live action and the real is that realistic looking mm, that's cool. um the game itself looks fantastic you know it's it's all at night or at in the early morning or dusk hours there's no like straight daytime play that i'm seeing um, and the streets are soaking wet all the time to highlight the fact that we're on the PS4 now instead of the PS3. So like every other game, there's wet streets to show how good the graphics are now. Yep. Um, Shiny. So Shiny's very important. From a car standpoint, uh, it, it felt good to me. You know, oh, yeah. I'm, not a, I'm not an aficionado of this shit, so I don't know, like, is it handling or working better uh, than the last Need for it's Speed? Not. Uh, I guarantee you it's not. not. Uh, pro- probably not. There's tons of... <laughs> There's tons of customization in the game. Um, so cynical. It's it's set in it's 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 very it's very similar to Burnout uh, Paradise in the con- in the context that it's set up, uh, like re- other recent Need for Speed games where it's uh, just an open world and you can go and you pull up to a certain place in the open world and hit the R1 button and you're now in the race kind of thing. Um, uh, but yeah, it's really the live action cutscenes that I thought were interesting about this, and I know it's going to get. I, I'll bet you money, Brent, that there's some people that are going to think it's pretty cool and a lot of people are going to think it's the dumbest fucking thing they've ever seen you know it, it is it represents kind of an interesting throwback well it's also kind of ironic given you know what we were talking about in the uh, in the clubhouse but it's just it's kind of an interesting throwback i mean what what it literally took me back to is i think one of the first games i ever played that had live action cutscenes was uh one of the wing commander games you know like mark hamill plays the lead like like you know ba- you basically you're playing the mark hamill character but uh, you know they had like a bunch of uh, they had a bunch of struggling at the time actors come through there like Malcolm McDowell was in he was in one of those fucking games at one point I remember I think that's the first place I ever saw Mark Dacascos who never quite became like a popular star but he was in like a really awesome kung fu movie that Tony and I are a big fan of called Drive and uh, Mark Dacascos was in one of those but I mean it just it, it just takes me back to yieldy uh, cutscenes from games that, yeah. it's just <laughs> yeah I don't know it's just kind of a neat nostalgia thing like is that yeah is it's that interesting that I, we're gonna have are we gonna have nostalgia for the days of really terrible voice acting in games and, and crappy blue screen live action cuts scenes from games is, is this that coming is that already here is that what this represents I don't know if we'll ever have nostalgia for live action cutscenes in games just because I don't think they're common enough they're not part of the lexicon in general I don't think well, they, they are uh, right now but there was a time when they reigned supreme uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I don't remember encountering them. It's interesting, though. It's not, like I said, it's, it, I kind of walked away with this, like, if it was done right, I, it might not be horrible, but uh, it's, it's going to get lambasted when this game comes out, I guarantee you. Yeah. Well, uh, I'm just playing uh, fucking Metal Gear Solid Five again. Yeah, go for it. I'm over 100 hours at this point. Oh, dear sweet Jesus. I'm not even remotely slowing down. I think I'm at 42% overall completion is what the game's telling me. Um, I can't, I can't stop. I don't even want to stop. Like, like Metal Gear is that drug that makes you a functional addict where you're just like, look, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to get my life in order so that I can function in society and still have enough time to be addicted to Metal Gear Solid five, which is basically what I've done. Um, my, my whole free time, like, like my whole schedule of just like off time, free time, whatever revolves around Metal Gear Solid 5, and it's like, okay, if I have less than an hour, then I'm doing side ops. If I have at least an hour and a half to two hours, then I'm doing a main story mission, and uh, and it's awesome. I just finished, I want to say it was episode 22, I want to say, uh, but there's a uh, th- there's an episode called, uh, I think it's like Take Back the Base or Take Back the Platform, but anyway, the point is that you have a hostile force threatening Mother Base, and they've they've taken over, I think, like the R and D platform on Mother Base, and you got to take it back, which you do. And although it's difficult, it, it, it's it's not uh, it, it was not an easy mission, and it was also interesting. It's the first time it's happened in the game where I was in the middle of doing another mission, and I get this call, and they're like, "We have an emergency situation. Somebody's like broken into Mother Base. We need you back here now." And the game says, "Do you want to?" St- like take on this emergency mission, you'll lose all the progress in this mission you're currently doing. And I was like, okay, well, yeah, I guess I will. And so then like I go and I do the emergency mission and I fail. I, I stupidly, I, 
I thought I was uh, I thought I was running off and I was going to like drop down and hang onto a ledge and I ended up just running right off the edge of the fucking platform <laughs> and killing myself. But anyway, the point is that so frustrating. It, it like it ejected me like there was no retry or anything like that. I go back to the original mission I'm doing. I finish that up and then eventually I like when I come back to Mother Base, I discover that this mission I uh, this emergency mission is now in the um, it's now in the mission list and you can select it. But the point is, after you do that mission, it unlocks the forward operating base mechanic of Metal Gear Solid Five, which is a really interesting hybrid. It ties into your single-player game. It basically means that you're going to build other remote bases in different areas around the world. And Remote bases like, like mother like, base bases? Like mother base bases, that's correct. Uh-huh, like, like, uh-huh. But you're managing them all remotely. It's it's just like all you know done through the iDroid, as opposed to like actually being able to visit them the way you can Mother Base. And there is no iDroid app for the real iDroids in the world, is uh, there? there? Well, there is a companion app, but it does not do like I feel like the companion app basically ought to be the fucking iDroid in the game. Like yeah, you right. ought to be able to do staff management, uh, weapon customization, base development. Like you ought to be able to do all that from the mobile app, and you can't, or at least you can't right now. Like and again, like I've been trying to use this fucking mobile app. Although I think I've discovered that the reason is because I I have the latest version of the iOS uh, operating system, and the uh, the app only works with the last one, iOS eight. I think that oh, might okay. be the problem I'm having. Anyway, but the FFB stuff is interesting because from the single player game perspective, it allows you to put more uh, put more people in each department. So you know, like once you get to like a hundred, like once you do four platforms. Uh, for each of your development legs, like you know the R and D team, the Intel group, medical, all that. Once you get like four platforms built up, you're done, and you can do like a hundred, I, I think a hundred people or whatever it is. But you do a forward operating base, and now suddenly you've got another base where you can put more people into your Intel team or your R and D team or whatever. So this is what's going to allow you to you know to to grow even more and get to those higher levels. Right. Yeah. Um but this also ties into the online component of the game because there is an attack and defend quality to the the FOBs. So you can go into and you can try to infiltrate another player's forward operating base. You can try to get their resources, you can try to get their personnel. They set up static def- I mean they've got personnel there and depending on the rank of the personnel, they're going to, you know, they're going to you know, obviously try to stop you from infiltrating the way that the AI in the game normally would. But in addition to that, there's like specific traps and things. There's like IR sensors. There's unmanned drones. There's security cameras. There's all kinds of stuff like that that the players can invest money in to outfit with their base to make it more difficult for you to infiltrate. And on top of that, the players can actually come into the game and defend their base directly. And it is an interesting idea that this... this this sort of hybrid thing where it contributes both to the single player and also forms the cornerstone of the multiplayer. That's it's a neat idea. It's, uh, you know, it's, I was thinking about that in the context of need for speed. They also, and I forgot to mention this while I was talking about, it, they also have a mechanic where when you first, um, so when you first launch the game, you have to log into the EA servers. Yeah. Uh, but once you're, once you're in that main menu and you ch- the, on the, when you hit the play button, you have a choice of doing it online or doing it solo. Uh, and basically it's the same world, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, but either there's other people populating it or there's not, and it's a similar thing. It sounds like a little bit different, uh, but but similar. Yeah, it sounds a lot different to me. But let's keep, well, let's let's it, let's just keep going. I mean, okay, look, you can drive a fucking Jeep in Metal Gear Solid Five, and you can drive a fucking car in Need for Speed. I agree, they have that in common. But one of these that- <laughs> one of these games is awesome, and the other one is Need for Speed. Okay. Uh, oh, I, thought, <laughs> that's what I'm I was going to say, and the other one's Metal Gear Solid. That's what we're saying here. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and ride into the sunset, uh, because the hour is getting late, and the sun is going down, so that would be the perfect time to do it. Lauren, it would. what is your end to the my, sunset? My end of the sunset this week is very straightforward. It is uh, the PS the 3.0 update to the PS4 mm-hmm. is now live of as last week, and Average Jam of... Uh, well, Aberjam fame of the Outlaw Gamer Society <laughs> has started an Outlaw Gamer uh, community on the PS4. He has made it uh, very apparent uh, on the website, letting people know uh, how to join that. But uh, if you are unaware of it, please know there is an Outlaw Gamer PS4 community and come join us. And uh, with that, Brent, I always try to remember to say a couple of things about if you're trying to friend me, uh, whether it's on PS4 or on Steam. And likewise for Brent, please tell us 
uh, that you are from Outlaw Gamer Society because I do not uh, accept just random friend requests. I've had accounts hacked and that sort of thing. And so please let me know that you are from Outlaw Gamer Society. Uh, and w- I will accept your friend request on either platform. Likewise, I do like to tell people every once in a while, if you try and friend me on Facebook, I do not use Facebook um, except for my uh, sort of immediate family kind of thing. And so don't be offended that I, I don't uh, accept your request on Facebook. It's, I just keep it separate from the gaming. I keep the gaming stuff on our website and on PlayStation and on uh, Steam and that sort of thing. So just to let you know. Um, but yeah, Outlaw Gamer Society on or Outlaw Gamer Society community on the PS4. Get into it. It's freaking awesome. Yeah, I finally can get into it because I was finally able to install the goddamn 3.0 update after trying. Well, for like we four also held back days. on approving your application. Yeah, well, there was that, of course. But uh, <laughs> I couldn't install 3.0 for like four days. Like, I, I, I tried to download it, you know, just like constantly, and it would just not work and not work and not work. And then finally, like four o'clock in the morning, I was, I was playing Metal Gear, and like I get this notification update now ready to install. It had finally been able to download. But anyway, hacked. Uh, I don't think it was hacked. I think it was just uh, lame. I think it was just lame network infrastructure. All right, Brent, what do you got for End of the Sunset this My week? My End of the Sunset this week is not directly game related, but uh, will have very serious repercussions in gaming as the years roll on. Yes, it will. As you may or may not be aware, uh, there's, there's, this famous, uh, there's this famous law, Moore's Law, which talks about processor power doubling every 18 months. Uh, it, speaking specifically to silicone-based uh, processors. But to everything, there is a threshold, and we are rapidly approaching the end of Moore's Law because basically the way that you know transistor works is you've got, a, uh, you've got an electron source, you have an electron drain, and then there is a gate between them, and whether the gate is on and allowing electrons to flow through or off gets you the binary on-off thing that transistors do. But there is a limit to how small you can make those gates. And five nanometers is, is generally speaking, the, uh, that, that's the limit. Like, you, you get them smaller than five nanometers, the Heidelberg uncertainty principle begins to have an effect, and electrons will begin leaking across the gate, whether it's open or closed. And you can't be certain where the electrons are, and therefore you don't have computational certainty in your computer software, and everything goes to hell. So the solution to this is to find some other material other than silicone to create transistors and computer processors, and people have been looking for this. It's an engineering thing. IBM may have finally cracked it. They say that they have found a way to manufacture transistors using carbon nanotubes, which is fantastic because carbon nanotubes are a great material for this application. This is fantastic, fantastic news. IBM says that they think they're going to be able to have a... Uh, a, a shipping product maybe by 2020, which is really good because we don't have much past 2020 to uh, to get any more juice out of silicon-based uh, CPUs. So anyway, this is a very, very big deal. It's got long-reaching implications. It's something that I have been following in uh, in just in science blogs and things like that for several years now. I'm very, very happy to hear that somebody has cracked this. It's going to do the world a lot of good and uh, anyway, I just wanted to share that news. I've got a link there. If you haven't read up on it, please do so. It's very interesting stuff. Brent, what I want to know is this going to get us to that other very famous thre- threshold that gets talked about quite a bit, which is, uh, is this going to get us to 1.21 gigawatts? Listen, the only thing that can get us to 1.21 gigawatts is plutonium or banana peels and, and half-filled beer cans. Those are the only two things that'll work, <laughs> whether or not you've had the Mr. Fusion upgrade. Although, now that we are here in October 2015, it seems like somebody ought to put out a commemorative Mr. Fusion. I mean, even if it's only a plastic thing that you can stick on the top of your car, we need to have a Mr. Fusion uh, for, to commemorate October 2015, which, of course, is the year that, uh, that Marty and Doc arrive in. Well, that's exactly right. All right, Brent. And coming along with us on our ride into the sunset, we have uh, another listener, uh, first time poster, uh, or at least first time poster uh, on the show, uh, I believe. And the, our listener's name is Julian What the? Okay. Julian What the writes. Uh, I read a recent article on Polygon by Matt Leone that discusses an aspect of game development that I had never really considered before secret developers in games. And he links to the story. Uh, In the past, there have been a number of examples of game companies farming out development to other studios or even smaller branches of the same studio, a la Ubisoft for the multiplayer aspect of some titles. Or even the more recent and prominent debacle that was and still remains, Aliens Colonial Marines. 
I believe the Deus Ex Human Revolution had an external developer handle the por- boss portions of that game to middling effect. That is exactly correct. <laughs> but the idea, uh, the idea that there are probably hundreds, if not more examples, putting that. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that there are probably hundreds, if not more examples, of games that are in part developed by shadow or secret developers operating under white contracts, in many cases going unnamed or credited, strikes me as a bit shocking, I guess you could say. It sparks the conspiracy theorist in me to look back on all the examples of games I've played in the past. Lousy installments in series I've otherwise loved, insanely difficult, cheap, or poorly designed parts of an otherwise balanced or enjoyable game. I can't help but to wonder how often this happens and what the ultimate effect is. Maybe that's just the skeptic in me, but I'd love to hear your take on the content of this article. Well, uh, Brent? Yes. I, 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 this is a this is a fascinating topic. I think, uh, and thank you, Julian Watha, for bringing it to us. I can say that um, uh, it, it feels odd to know that there are parts of games that are significant parts of games that are, that are farmed out. I remember when I found out that the boss battles uh, in uh, Deus Ex had been farmed out. That uh, I, I was it was shocking and upsetting to me, and it wasn't something we knew ahead of time, or at least I was not aware of ahead of time do you remember brent finding that out you know i i I, i'm trying to remember i mean i guess that i i understood that that was going on but i can't remember if there was some eureka moment where i see i don't think i knew it was going on and i remember when i found out i was kind of like oh that makes perfect sense because it feels completely disparate from the rest of the game it's like wow it's it's almost like the same team didn't make this part of the game that made this part of the game so that's exactly right certainly i've had those moments but i i don't know I, i guess you know it's one of those things that, like, you know, it's really common in, like, film and television, especially, like, like writers. I mean, you know, like, if you see, uh, if you see, like, you know, like, a couple of people credited on a film, there's a good chance, I mean, like, as writers, there's a good chance that, you know, that there's even more people. Like, Tarantino, he, he was a ghostwriter for years on movies, like, a fucking, uh, what's the one with Denzel Washington and uh, uh, the submarine movie with Gene Hackman? Crimson Tide, I think. Tarantino mm-hmm. is a ghostwriter on Crimson Tide, uh, not credited, or maybe he's credited these days, but not when the film came out. Uh, and, and you can totally see, you know, his dialogue in that movie in certain scenes. One of my favorite movies ever, uh, Ronan, was uh, like the original script and story for the movie is written by this guy named J.D. Zeke or Zeke. It's a fucking terrible. Like I've read his screenplay; it's absolutely awful. And uh, and David Mamet, who's one of, if not the greatest uh, screenwriter of of this era. Uh, came back in and and basically rewrote it uncredited, uh, and you know like like that kind of thing. Like I'm aware of that kind of thing like happening in film and stuff like that. So I guess it doesn't surprise me all that much that that kind of thing you know does go on behind the scenes. But you look at those kinds of things and you begin to wonder about like all these other like little things that have bugged you about games along the way, and you're like, huh. Although I do wonder, Brent, uh, of the I don't know how many copies Batman Arkham Origins sold. I'm just let's just make up two million. Okay. Uh, of those, the million, it certainly was in the millions, I'm sure. Of the millions of people that bought uh, Batman Arkham Origins, I wonder how many didn't know that it was made by another company. Uh, you know, I don't know, uh, because I often, I think I often overestimate how uh, informed people are about stuff like that. Uh, you know, because we're we're in a world where, where the people we converse with are informed. Yeah. I mean, certainly, I, mean, like, I know, think people, the tra- I think the Treyarch... Closely. I think the whole Call of Duty series, I think a lot of players of Call of Duty know that, but I wonder if players of, say, Batman even knew that that game was made by somebody else. I don't know that the people who play Call of Duty even know that. I mean, <laughs> some of them. Some Maybe of not. Them, I, I, don't w- I wonder what those percentages are. But yeah, it, so that's the thing. I, th- I think that for a lot of people out there, it doesn't matter. I, you know, they, all they look at is you know the game, and you know they watch the trailer, they see it's Call of Duty, the new Call of Duty or whatever, and they're going to buy it. I, I think there's a lot of people that don't care, but you know, if you're one of those people that does follow the industry the way that we do, and you are kind of interested in the, you know, the, the personalities and the process and everything, it, uh, it 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 will definitely change your perspective on on things. And I think a lot of times it is a little bit like a sausage factory. Like you know, we all want the end product, but and similar to what we were talking about in the topic earlier, sometimes watching the process happen is not is not the best thing for your enjoyment of the end result. That is a true story. All right. Uh, with that, Brent, I think we will call it a show. Yeah. As usual, thank you, Julian, what the, again, for your comment. As usual, we want to hear what everybody in the community thinks about all the topics we talked about on tonight's show, whether it's the topic that Julian what the brought up with regard to secret game developers, uh, what we talked about into the sunset, the new PS4 community, or IBM unlocking the secret to carbon nanotubes. 
talked about in the road insurgency rocket league the need for speed beta and metal gear solid 5 uh, up at the clubhouse we discussed prominent voice actors uh, who are having trouble negotiating with publishers go figure mm-hmm. and then of course in the garage we talked about go kid gamer opencritic.com Squeenix shutting down the Augment Your Pre-Order program, thank God, and what is sure to be the game of 2015, Assassin's Creed Syndicate. We want to hear your thoughts on that <laughs> and everything. You sure it's not going to be uh, talking about? That's right, in gaming. Uh, as usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgart. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs>